Welcome. Welcome to Broadmoor Community Church, a church that really does believe so strongly, no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome to God's embrace. You are welcome. I am Reverend Ann Cubbage, and it is my privilege to be the senior pastor of this amazing congregation. You who are online, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to come and worship. Those of you who are online, I don't know where you might find yourself, but you know what? No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, God is with you. As we prepare for worship today, I wanted to remind you of several of the slides that are at the very end of this service. I hope you will go to them to get the information that you need about small groups. We have Zoom and in person, about children and youth activities, about our Lenten activities. We have a book study that is just starting up this week, about our prayer ministry, I also hope that you know that if you want to pray with and for me, with and for the church, or have me do that for you, please contact me. The information is at the back. And so I also invite you to give to the ministries of this church. You have already been so very generous. There are several ways to do it, and again, they are on the slides, but you can give by texting 719-309-4498. You can give by mailing it in to 315 Lake Avenue. You can drop it by, and I'd love to get to know you if you live or are visiting in Colorado Springs. I hope that you recognize that there are so many ministries that you have contributed to and made viable and, and strong. One of those is our partnership with Fox Meadow Middle School. Another is our extreme partnership with Westside Cares. Both of those ministries are right in our neighborhood and you have helped us. But of course, there are also the ministries here in and around our neighborhood. God bless you for your generosity. And now I would invite you to take in a deep breath and to hear this prayer. Oh God, at the wedding party in Cana, we ask for a Christ encounter today. The wine of our lives and souls seems to have run out. Fill this place that we find ourselves with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Fill the water pots of our souls this day with new and fresh wine. The wine of yesterday is gone. It is stale. It is old, God. Send your power in this place and in the lives of your people. Help us to know that the best wine is yet to come, and we can taste and see your goodness. Show yourself this day to be powerful and awesome and for all times to come. Amen. Hello, everyone. It's Miss Liz. How are you today? It's so good to see you. Thanks for watching. So, my friends, I'm wondering, have you seen God anywhere in your life this week? Well, no, you're right. We don't actually see God with our eyes. But if we look with the eyes of our hearts, sometimes we can see God right in the midst of our everyday lives. God is anywhere where there is love and kindness and justice. So maybe you had a moment with your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, and you felt so much love for one another. Well, God was right there. Or maybe at school, you had a friend 
who was having a hard time with something and you helped that friend out, you were kind to them. Well, God was right there also. And maybe there was someone at school who was being treated unfairly and you stood up for that person. You worked for justice. Well, God was right in that moment. But guess what? God is not just in those moments. God is even in the moments where we feel hurt or afraid. God is close to us when we're feeling hurt and afraid. God is with us always. So this week, I want you to try to use the eyes of your heart and look and see if you can see God in some moments in your life. Why don't we say a prayer? You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. Help me to see you in the normal, everyday moments of my life. Help me to use the eyes of my heart to see God. We love you. Amen. All right, my friends, go out. Look for God in your life, and I'll see you again soon. Here, a scripture reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at a wedding feast in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited and were there. When the wine was all gone, Mary said to Jesus, they don't have any more wine. Jesus replied, mother, my time hasn't come yet. You must not tell me what to do. Mary then said to the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. At the feast, there were six stone jars for water that were used by the people for washing themselves in the way that their religion said they must. Each jar held about 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants to fill them to the top with water. Then after the jars had been filled, he said, now, take some water and give it to the man in charge of the feast. The servants did as Jesus told them, and the man in charge drank some of the water that had now turned into wine. He did not know where the wine had come from, but the servants did. He called the bridegroom over and said, the best wine is always served first. Then, after the guests have had plenty, the other wine is served. But you." I've kept the best until last. Will you pray with me? 
Holy God, open our hearts, our minds, and our ears that we may hear what you say to us this day. Amen. Close encounters often are transforming. Consider the servants in this pericope. They are fully aware that the wine is running out. Will it be their heads that roll, or is that the sole responsibility of the man in charge of the feast? Even so, who wants to tell him about this predicament? If I had been in their places, I would have been tempted to keep my mouth shut, to let the chips fall where they may. But suddenly, they are confronted by Mary, who also recognizes the problem, and she brings in another, her son, Jesus. Too many witnesses, too, too many. The servants must have been beside themselves with angst, caught in the middle of a situation that was not of their making, but would ultimately affect them, and certainly not in a good way. When the woman instructs them to do whatever Jesus tells them to do, they must have been granted a glimmer of hope for their situation. This guy, Jesus, was going to bail them out. They wouldn't have to speak to the man in charge of the feast, threatened by his anger and possibly worse. They wouldn't be blamed for the scarcity that would hang over the newlyweds for the rest of their lives. They couldn't be criticized or held responsible for what tradition claimed would be a life of hardship for the couple. Never able to gain the respect of the community, never blessed with rewards of children, all because the wine ran out at the wedding. No one else knew what Jesus told the servants to do, but they moved with alacrity. It was crazy, but it was their last best hope. Can't you see them hurrying to create an assembly line from the house to the town well and back? How long would it take them to fill those six 30-gallon jars? Can't you hear them talking amongst themselves, asking questions, voicing doubt about this outrageous command? Then, standing there, breathing heavily, becoming less and less optimistic as Jesus tells them to take some water and give it to the man in charge of the feast. What? They were going to have to speak to their boss anyway? Do you suppose they drew straws to determine who would have to take on this onerous task? Did they all crowd into the room with bated breath as their boss drank? Did they see his face as he looked around at them in wonder? And did they hear the commotion as he confronted the bridegroom, chastising him for withholding the best wine for last? Did they laugh with relief? Did they head back towards the stone jars with plans to taste of this fine wine themselves? Did they fall at Jesus' feet in gratitude and wonder? What did they say to their families and friends? These servants had had a close encounter with Christ and their lives would never be the same again. Folks, this is an amazing story about extravagant abundance, a story about hope in a world that is much too taken with scarcity. You've heard other stories as unbelievable as this and as filled with God's grace as this. The stories of folks down to their last penny, but needing to pay the rent when a check for exactly that amount comes to them. Or a couple who, unable to conceive, pray for a child, although they argue over the name she should have. Amanda? Autumn? When suddenly they are contacted by an adoption agency about two sisters in need of a home, one named Autumn and the other Amanda. Or food pantries down to their last few pallets of food when surprisingly a huge donation arrives at their back door. And more than likely, you know the time that a group of folks lost in the wilderness with no food were given a strange flaky substance called manna. Our cups overflow with God's extravagant abundance. 
Remember those disciples who gathered up 12 baskets of bread after 5,000 men and many other children and women were fed with the boys five loaves and two fish. Those people had no idea of the miracle that had fed them. And today, the bridegroom, not realizing the miraculous, found himself with more wine than would ever be needed for many a wedding to come. Jesus took the jars meant to hold water for ritual purification and used them for something new. He took the symbols of legalistic religion and poured God's transforming love right into them, all the way to the brim. Jesus steps into our lives and transforms our scarcity into abundance, our moans and shouts of joy, and our cups overflow. Christianity is not for legalists. The purpose of this extravagant abundance is to bring happiness and joy, blessings. This abundance makes us free to love. This extravagance allows us to know that God loves imperfect people. God's love allows us to be fully human in all of our sorrow, in all of our guilt, in all of our stupidity, in all of our bunglings. We are forgiven, loved, and definitely celebrated. Folks, we can never be kind enough. We can never be good enough. We can never be loving enough. We will always be too selfish. And yet, a close encounter with Christ offers gallons of grace for you and for me. Our gospel reading today reminds us that a close encounter with God's extravagant grace is irrational and mysterious. It is powerful and life-altering. In this story, we have an example of Jesus providing far more than anyone ever hoped for or even imagined. And it serves as a reminder to us all of the richness, the pervasiveness of God's involvement in our lives. This story reminds us of the transformation of our lives in and through ordinary moments. In this miracle, we see God involved in life's smaller events. Jesus did not seek to create or live in the middle of great fanfare. Instead, he entered the world in the midst of the poor. He chose to teach as he ate at a small dinner table, as he called common fishermen, as he went to a wedding, or as he sat on a grassy hillside. He entered Jerusalem on a lowly donkey. His actions reveal God's choice to be in the midst of the everyday. And it is in our, yours and mine, every day that life is transformed. How might a close encounter with Christ transform you? Will you recognize God's extravagant grace and choose to be extravagant with your own life? How might you use your time, your abilities, and your money in a rational, exuberant, and wonderful ways in order to create a taste of the joy that must have been part of the wedding celebration once the new wine was presented. Do your children need to experience an extravagant amount of your attention? Do your partner or your parents need to be overwhelmed? In what ways do we need to believe that God works in our midst? in our budget deliberations, in our willingness to give 10% rather than 5% of our income, in our negotiations about buildings or parking lots or gardens, in our mindset. Are we focused on maintenance, on scarcity, or on the abundance of God's mission? Are you ready for a close encounter with Christ? Do you want something extravagant to happen? Are you prepared for a seismic shift, a transformation in your life and the life of those around you? I pray that it is so. Amen.
As we come to this time of prayer, I'm going to invite you to a time of silence. I will then say prayers for the people, and I would invite you to join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. Holy, amazing, loving God, we thank you for the abundance of your blessings in our lives. Help us to put on our glasses, to really be able to recognize our close encounters with you, with Jesus the Christ, all through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, on this day, we come to you thanking you for a place to live. We come thanking you for the people in our lives. We come thanking you for enough. But God, we know there are so many in our world who are struggling, who find themselves a year out from a war that seemed to be unprovoked, that is killing civilians ruining homes, causing people to shiver in desperate cold and hunger. Holy God, we ask that you would be with those in so many places of war. For those in our own country who struggle, who stand on the street corners for whatever reason, help us to not judge them but instead to recognize them as your beloved children. God, we come to you today wondering how we can truly best be your instruments of love, of abundant grace, of extravagance, of joy. Help us to know how we can best be your own children, following in Jesus' footsteps. Help us to know how we can help those that are in our circles, as well as those that are not. Help us to understand that we do not have to live a life of scarcity, that instead you offer us gallons of grace. You offer us miracles that we don't even recognize as miracles, opportunities. God, on this day, we ask that you would be with the leaders of our country and of our world, that they might really believe that they are working for you and for your people. We pray these things today using the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to go out into the world, I invite you to get yourself ready, to grab your coat or your swimming suit or whatever it is. Take a plate of cookies. Go out into the world expecting and knowing that you will have an encounter, a close encounter with Christ. Go out knowing that you are loved. Go out knowing that you have a message to share with others. Go out in peace.